can it be done? But there are manuals that will tell you how. So for instance, we have the US Field Manual on Guerrilla Warfare. Now this was written by your tax dollars, so you might as well read it. Right? Just saying, um, asymmetric warfare. If there was ever an asymmetric conflict, this is it. So the six principles of asymmetric warfare, um, this is when one group has all the money and the guns and the power and the other group doesn't have anything. That pretty much would sum us up, I think. Um, this is not a pitched battle because you'd never win. Um, so it's a stupid thing to even call for. Um, what you're after is something called cascading systems failure. Okay? You, uh, cascading systems failure. Okay? You accomplish your objective swiftly and then you disappear to fight again. Now need I add, the point is not to make a statement. It's to have a decisive material impact. Now the reason you can learn about asymmetric warfare in places like West Point and the US Army and training camps all over the world is because it works. The principles have been honed for decades as a strategy, direct attacks on infrastructure. It's highly effective. So got to stop people from saying that this doesn't work. I mean, proven, tried and true, this works. Beyond these principles, you can learn about target selection. This hits my happy spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Criticality, how important is this target? Vulnerability, how tough is the target? Accessibility, can you get to it? And finally, recuperability, what would it take for them to replace it? And suddenly, there's some stuff that starts to make sense. The, one of the reasons that groups like the ELF and the ALF have really had no decisive success is target selection. All their targets are low criticality, high recuperability. Very typical for resistance groups that lacks training. Right? Targets are chosen because they're easy to get to, they're accessible, but those targets aren't in any way critical and they're really easily repaired. This would be your basic Starbucks window strategy. Now I say this as someone who has broken her share of windows. I have personally destroyed thousands of dollars of property. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, but if this is what you're doing, it's basically pointless. Why? Low criticality, high recuperability. Breaking windows does not stop the bad people from doing that bad thing for even one second. Um, we've got to stop thinking like vandals and start feeling, thinking like field commanders. So we've been carrying out these operations that are emotionally appealing in the hopes that they will somehow be effective. Now I call this emotional activism. Um, this was also the problem, for instance, with groups like the Weather Underground. Um, increasing your firepower will not actually increase the effectiveness of your strategy. Um, so you're not going to walk away from this with like a serious grounding in the principles of you know, guerrilla warfare. My point, though, is that other people have already figured this out. They are serious people, and they are people who intend to win. They have a goal, they have a grand strategy, and after examining the actual resources at hand, they move on to tactics. So I would say we have a two-part goal. Disrupt and dismantle industrial civilization, to remove the ability of the rich to steal from the poor, and the powerful to destroy the planet. I think we can get behind that. Um, part two, defend and rebuild just sustainable autonomous human communities and assist in the recovery of, of the land base. Now these two goals are interdependent. Um, the movements involved are going to have to work in tandem for either to be successful. One or the other is not gonna do it. And that's why I really want the permaculture wing to get on board. We need them to do part two. That's their job. Um, it's gonna take lots and lots of people to do part two and mostly above ground, and mostly involved in fairly large organizations, and mostly nonviolent. I, there's, you know, most of this could be done using nonviolence again. Part one could be achieved using nonviolent tactics. Um, we don't have the numbers, and I think most of us in this room probably know that. So it's going to take that underground network that's both well-trained and dead serious. Now, in case you can't find a way to hope, I think there is some hope. Uh, the above ground could take some inspiration from the French labor strike that happened last October, now this was you know, in defense of workers' rights. They used uh, trucks, burning tires, and human chains to blockade uh, the fuel depots, and they closed all 12 of France's oil refineries. The major oil ter terminal was offline for three weeks, which stranded 30 oil tankers in the Mediterranean because they couldn't offload the oil. When the government tried to open the emergency reserves, they escalated, and the protesters went on to blockade 20 more terminals. This is what you do. <laughs> in a few weeks, the entire economy of the country was slowing to a halt for lack of fuel. Now that's thinking systematically, and they were headed toward that cascading systems failure because they hit the nodes that were important. The energy infrastructure is absolutely crucial. This is what you learn to do when you are at you know, military training camp, and there's no reason we can't apply these principles. Now, the, so the French did did what every military and every insurgency does, whether you agree with them or not, left or right, they all use the same tactics because they work. Um, they were well on their way to completely shutting down the economy and they did it using nonviolence. 
So this could be done if we had the bodies. The question is, do we? For the underground, um, I would say that your best inspiration is MEND. This is the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta. Now, the oil industry has learned, earned literally billions of dollars off of um, Nigeria's oil supply. The Niger Delta is the world's largest wetland, and you could not call it a wetland anymore. You could call it a sludge land, perhaps, but it's completely dead. The people there used to be self-sufficient as fishers and farmers. No more. They're all sick and starving because the oil industry has killed them and killed the land. Oil accounts for 40% of the gross domestic product of Nigeria. So they control the government. It's a military junta, on and on. Um, the indigenous people um, had uh, a, an original resistance that was called MOSAP, and this was led by the poet activist Ken Sarawiwa. Um, this was a nonviolent campaign to um, drive out Royal Dutch Shell and the military regime. In 1995, Sarawiwa and eight of his um, friends, the, the leaders of this movement, were all hanged by a military tribunal. It was just completely corrupt. You know, huge outcry around the world of human rights organizations. Nobody could save them. They were, they were all killed. Um, so MEND is the second generation, and they do not use nonviolent tactics. They use a lot of property destruction. They do direct attacks on, and they do kidnapping too. I shouldn't, you know, sugarcoat this. They do kidnapping. Um, but they do attacks on uh, pipelines, on bridges, on terminals, on um, storage facilities, pipelines, all of it, support vessels. They have reduced Nigeria's oil output by a dramatic one third. In one single attack, they were able to stop 10% of the country's oil output. One attack, 10%. They did a series of attacks last December, right before Christmas. 80% of the oil went down in one week. Right. This could be done. Um, and so this main tactic is the use of speedboats in surprise attacks against simultaneous targets at the same time, right, toward that goal of disrupting the entire system. So cascading systems failure. You figure out the nodes, you attack them. Um, and these people are quite serious. Um, the French did it nonviolently because they had the numbers. MEND uses these other tactics because they don't. What we know about MEND is they have university educations. Um, they've studied other militant movements very clearly. Their training in combat is so good that they have gone up against Nigeria's elite fighting units as well as the private militaries of um, the oil industry. Pause. Did you know that the oil industry has their own, they have their own private militaries? Yeah. I'm sure you have this discussion all the time with people in your lives, but like, where do you think oil comes from? I mean, you can't plant it in the backyard with the nasturtiums people, right? It doesn't fall out of the sky like rain. You know, it's got to be ripped out of the land, which means people have to be ripped off the land, which means those people have to be ripped in half, and that would be called a private military. So men just come up against these folks, and they've won in these skirmishes. Um, they also have, quote, broad sympathy among the Niger Delta community. So that sympathy helps them a lot because it means people take them in. They don't turn them over to the authorities. Um, this is a true resistance movement. It's not a bunch of armed thugs, and they number just a few hundred. So understand this. A few hundred people, well-trained, um, with the correct strategy, you know, well-organized, they have reduced the oil output of Nigeria by a third. MEND has said to the oil industry, leave our land while you can or die in it. Now, I can guarantee that everyone in this room, as an individual, had more, has more resources you know, at our disposals than all of MEND had put together when they started. Resistance is not just theoretically possible, it's happening now. The only real question is, will we join them? What if we said, leave our land or you will die in it? And what if we meant it?